I guess one of the things that's really amazed me this, this morning is how truly global this informatics in healthcare thing is now. And I've really enjoyed the presentations this morning and hope that what I can help with this afternoon is a little bit about what we've been doing in a place called the Wirral in, in England, which uh, is very near Liverpool, uh, to actually digitise our hospital. Um, there's a picture of the, our, our front entrance um, at the hospital. Um, our vision as a hospital is to create a truly joined up, efficient and informed patient journey. And I think the most important word in there is about the patient, based on secure, real-time patient data. And it's not me that said that, that's David Allison, our chief executive, my boss. And the really great thing about the picture that you can see on that screen is the fact, and everybody will recognise this, that my boss is smiling. Now, don't, isn't that what we all want to achieve when we go to work? Well, I'm sure we want to achieve other things as well, but a smiling boss is the most important thing, particularly as that picture was taken the morning after we'd completely turned upside down the way that nursing works in our organisation and moved them completely away from recording their records on paper to recording their records into an electronic system. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we did that and also some of the things that we've learned from it. So if we think about that global challenge for informaticians, for years I'm sure you've all been to conferences where that global challenge has been about removing these things. And I'm sure in your country, just like in ours, you have something that looks a bit similar to that, that have been traditionally trolleyed on a, around the hospital, lots of, lots of members of staff moving pieces of paper around. And of course, for years what we've been saying is, wouldn't it be great if we got rid of the paper? And increasingly, as a hospital, we have got rid of the paper. So if you come into our maternity unit, you won't see a piece of paper that's used as part of the healthcare record. Well, you might find a little piece of paper if we had a referral letter in from primary care, but very, very little paper. And because that information is digital, it also means that if you're seen afterwards in a community clinic some miles away from the hospital, that digital record is available there as well. And we've had considerable advantages simply out of getting rid of the paper. Again, if you come into our hospital and have medicines prescribed, in the same system, you will see uh, 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 that all of our medicines are prescribed electronically, and all of our medicines are administered electronically. And that's given us some massive advantages in terms of knowing which patients are due which drugs at which time. It's given us all sorts of advantages in terms of decision support and checking for allergies and so on and so forth to make sure that the drugs that we give are absolutely the best drugs that you could give in the organisation. And if you come into our organisation, you'll start to see doctors using voice recognition, using predefined forms, moving away from this fabulous writing that I'm sure we all know uh, in terms of traditional paper notes. And as part of that, we've actually been able to make some very significant improvements in the way that our organisation runs. And out of those improvements, we've been able to make some very significant cost savings. So as an example, this year alone, we'll be able to reduce our administrative costs by about a million pounds out of our 300 million pound budget a very significant amount simply by reducing the amount of paper that we move around the organisation, streamlining the clerical work of our staff and introducing voice recognition to take away the work of having to type letters and so on and so forth. Beyond that, we've also been able to create nearly two million pounds worth of benefits associated with making better use of our facilities as an organisation. So now our outpatient department can check on a daily basis if there are any appointment slots available and send a text reminder out to um, patients to remind them to come into uh, their appointments. And through that, we've been able to reduce our DNA rate, the, the rate of people that don't attend because they've forgotten, from about 15% down to single digit 6-7%. Massive improvements in... in, in um, 
in, in, in the way the organization works and its efficiencies. But I think what I wanted to talk to you about today was that there is a difference, and I think it's becoming increasingly clear to us, between actually making a digital record, taking away the paper, and being able to have really good administrative workflows across the organization, and a digital hospital. And what's become clear to us over the, over the I guess, the last 18 months is once you've got a digital record, what that actually means to the way that healthcare is delivered and the, some of the quality and safety improvements that you can put in place associated with that. We actually believe that you can create time to care so that the nurses and the doctors can spend less of their time looking for notes and more of their time treating the patients. Simply by digitizing our health records, our nurses are spending more time with the patients, be it because they now input into those records at the bedside, rather than going away to write in them, or because actually it's quicker. So as an example, in our old paper-based systems, if we were doing a risk assessment about whether somebody was likely to fall, we'd talk about their mobility and we'd record details about their mobility. Later on, another nurse would come along and do a, a, pressure, a, a pressure saw audit to see whether the patient was likely to gather a pressure saw and ask the same questions again. In a digital world, you can ask the questions once and they flow through to all of those records uh, uh, all at the same time without having to ask the patient the same question time and time again. We're able to use something that we call Care Compass. It's a Cerner solution that tells the nurses exactly where they're up to with every single patient. So have all the meds been given? Has the blood pressure been taken? Has the temperature, sent, uh, the temperature been taken? Uh, where are they up to? We're doing all of the assessments, the falls assessment and so on and so forth. Live on screen, each nurse knows exactly where they're up to with the quality standards that we've set for every patient across organi our organization. We can start to collect the information that's required at discharge so that we can tell our colleagues in primary care what's happening. We can look at, at bringing in vital signs information, not simply by having to use a vital signs machine and type in the data, but simply by connecting those vital signs machines directly into our electronic patient record. Our belief is also that better care is cheaper care. I don't know how many people are aware of sepsis. It's not something that's been new, talked about a lot in the UK, which is surprising, really, because in the UK, more than 100,000 people are admitted to hospital with sepsis every year, and it's estimated that 37,000 people in the UK die of sepsis uh, every year, and that the cost to the NHS is something like £2.5 billion, and as long as when I did the conversion right this, uh, if I did the conversion right this morning, that's about uh, 31 billion uh, kroner. Um, the key thing about sepsis is to identify the condition really early on, because if you can identify sepsis really on and get antibiotics in, then there's a 7.6% chance per hour of, of, of uh, improvement in, in making sure that the patient survives. If not, and it can, uh, it can impact on anybody of any age, then your chances of survival by about three days are virtually negligible. What we've been able to do, and recognizing that doctors really struggle to find sepsis, because we've got a complete electronic record, we know all of the vital signs, we know all the drugs, and so on and so forth, we've been able to use that big data to be able to identify when patients are likely to be suffering from sepsis. And up pops on screen on our electronic patient record a sepsis alert. And what that helps the doctors and nurses do is to do the right thing and do the right thing quickly. And therefore, there are people alive today that wouldn't be alive today because they got that sepsis alert out quickly. It also has helped in other ways because it's helped to create an awareness amongst our clinicians about what sepsis is and, where it, uh, and, and which patients are likely to be suffering from it. 
And I repeat, it's only because we've got a single system with all the information about the patient that we've been able to monitor the 15 odd variables that allow you to accurately identify that somebody's at risk of sepsis. You can't do it, we don't believe, if you've got a variety of standalone best of breed systems across the organization. We've also done something similar for acute kidney injury. The numbers are slightly smaller, but no less worrying. It's estimated that the NHS spends between 4.34 uh, million and 620 million, which I think is about 5.3 billion kroner, on treating acute kidney injury. That means that we spend more on acute kidney injury than breast cancer or lung cancer and skin cancer combined, despite those being headline news um, for the press and nobody talking about acute kidney injury. Clearly, if we could only identify just 20% of those people that were at risk of acute kidney injury, then that would be a significant saving, both in terms of people's lives, but also in terms of cost savings. And again, we use big data within our system to identify those people that we think are at risk of acute kidney injury and to alert the, 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 the clinical members of staff. What we've also been able to do is also, as well as identify patients that are at risk of acute kidney injury, is to push to the doctors then the best practice for the treatment of acute kidney injury. And there you can see an order set that's been electronically automatically generated based on the fact that the patient potentially has an injury to make sure that the patient's had the right tests and gets the right treatment standardized across the whole of our organization. So what's made us successful as a hospital? Well, first of all, we saw a strategic opportunity to deliver a digital hospital as an organization. We use a system called CERN and Millennium. Not that I've spoken about CERN or Millennium at all since I've been on the stage, because it's our Millennium, it's our IT system, it's not CERN's. We've taken it from them, but it's ours, and we treat it as ours. It's the way we do things, so we don't allow clinicians and by and large, clinicians are very happy to comply with using the system. We don't have people that continue to use paper. Every nurse has been, uh, is expected to use the system without exception. We recognize that there's been significant challenges getting to where we are. And I think everybody understands that the challenges we've been through are absolutely a vital part of that improvement. Our doctors see the system as a medical tool, not as an IT system. And we always remember that this is a people project, not a technology project. The technology exists to create a digital hospital and to get some of the benefits I've described. Actually putting them in and using them is about change and people management, not technology management. But I also wanted to take this a little stage further. I think one of the things we've also learned is, and I wouldn't want to stand on the stage here and pretend that if in your hospitals you were to make them completely digital and do some of the things that we've managed, that that's the end of the story. These here are the, uh, demog uh, some of the information about our local health economy. And if you can see it, and I don't know if you can, what you'll see is that we have some of the worst alcohol misuse rates in the whole of the country. We have problems with depression. We have problems with children living in poverty, and so on and so forth. And in actual fact, my digital hospital won't solve any of those problems. And therefore, actually, there's more to be done to create a truly digital health economy and to improve the health of the population beyond what would happen in a digital hospital. We recognize that as an acute hospital there, we, for we can't solve the problems of our population on our own. And that some of the demographic things that are coming to hit all health systems in terms of the aging population and the possibilities of making people's lives live longer and better are absolutely things that we need to resolve as a wider health economy, working together with primary care and increasingly with social care, and with housing, and with education, and with criminal justice. 
And I think we've been particularly inspired by some of the work that we've seen from some of the accountable care organizations from the States. And if anybody's heard of NUCA, which is an Alaskan organization, then they are absolutely fabulous. If you haven't, then look it up. Because what they've been able to do is to really drive forward the population health in a way that's involved all of their citizens. And of course, what we need to remember is that the determinations of health are actually far deeper than what we can provide in terms of an acute system. Be it because you live in a fabulous leafy uh, house uh, in what is our, the west of our, our patch, or maybe somewhere that's slightly more, or considerably more deprived. We know that we have high levels of depression, despite being the highest prescribers of, antibiotic, uh, sorry, of antidepressants. We know that we have problems with unemployment. Unemployment is one of the biggest things that will determine your health as you go through life. Some of these things don't have actually a medical answer. So what we've been trying to do is to work together ourselves, plus also the other providers of health and social care and housing and so on and so forth, to see if we can create what we're calling a digital health economy or a digital health and social care economy. Recognizing that if we really, really understood our population and really had the data across a population that we currently have in the hospital about those patients while they're in hospital, then we'd be able to identify those patients that were at risk of their health getting worse. So the first thing is really know our population and be able to identify and predict those patients that are going to, in future, demand acute services and to avoid them coming into acute uh, work. And then also to use that data and also incentivize all of the partners that I spoke about so that they're all incentivized to do the right thing. Now, I'm going to be a little bit careful because we've got some fabulous speakers in a minute or two that are going to talk about diabetes. And I hope I'm not going to get any of this wrong. And they'll tell me when they come on the stage, I'm sure. But we all know that one of the most important things about diabetes is making sure that people get regular exams on their feet and their eyes and so on and so forth. In the UK, we incentivize primary care in order to make sure that those things happen. So we pay primary care an amount of money for every patient on their list that gets those things. We incentivize GPs, primary care. But for those patients that don't go and see their GP, they, and they use, for example, our emergency department instead because their lives don't I mean they're that bit more chaotic, when they turn up at our emergency department, we just treat the thing they turn up for and don't know and aren't incentivized to check that they've had their foot exam. So we're working on not only an electronic system that pulls the data from all of our different systems to be able to risk stratify and know who these patients are, but also to make sure that we all know across the whole health economy whether they have or haven't had those things that will improve their health care. And the way that we're looking at this is that, and I guess people have seen this, this, is, this, is, this has been used quite a few times. We know that there's a small number of high-risk patients that take up a huge amount of the expenditure in any healthcare system. And really, we've been working really hard to make sure that we look after those patients as best we can. But it's that next trapezium down, the rising risk patients, that I think is the key to sustainable healthcare systems across the world. It's about identifying them and then making sure that they get the best care so that they stop in that trapezium and don't move up into the top triangle where their lives will be impacted and the costs of healthcare go up. So we've got lots of work to do. We're working with Cerner to be able to pull the data out of all of our primary care systems, out of our acute systems, out of housing, out of our community and mental health systems across the whole of our population, a population of 330,000 people, to be able to identify those people that are at risk of certain diseases, diabetes being one, 
to be able to identify them and to make sure that they get the best possible care, and to work with our clinicians to describe what absolutely that best possible care is, and then incentivize each of our organizations to be able to achieve it. And that way we move from uh, effectively a system in the UK, where as a hospital we get paid for amputating people's um, uh, toes and so on and so forth because their diabetic care has failed to being paid to avoid them getting, having to have those amputations in the first place. So that's basically what we've been doing. Um, I think we're on a really exciting journey. I think the key to all of this is pulling together all of the data that we've got out of our systems and recognizing that because we've got a digital record, we can move to a digital hospital and a digital health economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you.